Good afternoon and thanks for staying so long. And um, last day, like, can people hear me okay or do I need to switch the mic? And uh, I'll try and speak slow enough. I had an experience like some of you, the Australians might have picked up that I'm a non Australian. This is a New Zealand accent. And sometimes it's even harder to understand an Australian. But I uh, did work in the Middle East and lived here for a while, so I'm just so I'm able to talk to you. <laughs> Um, look, as, my name is John Young, and uh, look, I, uh, I'm more than anxious about doing this, and it's not because I don't, I don't like an audience. Um, my family, my friends, and my staff will tell you that I do like an audience, but I was asked to speak here about research, and I, I don't really consider myself a researcher as such. I mean, I did a, a PhD uh, about 10 years ago. Sometimes, and I look back and uh, wonder whether that was a worthwhile use of my time. It was on the subject of assessment. Uh, and uh, towards the end of it, somebody asked me, um, you know, what do you think the difference will be? And uh, I said, I think my friends and colleagues will refer to me as doctor in a very sarcastic manner. And that has been the main action there. <laughs> um, and uh, so, but look, I, I have been really interested in education research and done a lot of reading over quite a long career in education. And it started way back in 1980 when uh, I went for a gap year. And for me, it took six years and I was labouring in, uh, in New Zealand and, and in Australia. And then I arrived in 1980 um, back at the University of Canterbury and I started studying education. And I was fascinated about it. And uh, for those who were in Greg's uh, presentation earlier. I, a lot of the stuff I really remember and try to work on was uh, a lot of that good and broken, uh, broken sign stuff about how do you take what we know about good pedagogy and put it into practice. And so that's been a, an interest of mine and it's been, I suppose, a lot of reading, a lot of reflecting on literacy, behaviour, and also, what's the education experience like for, for children from, from backgrounds of poverty? Children who don't have the cultural capital, the educational capital, and how can we make it work best for them? And uh, so I, I was principal in um, three schools in Wellington, and in uh, 2010, my wife and I decided to go and put a bit of adventure. Locked up and we ended up in Libya about eight months before the revolution. So I had the experience of a principal of trying to get their staff out as you know through roadblocks and things like that. We spent some time in Egypt and then spent some time in Dubai. Now if you spend a year in Egypt, Dubai is like dying and going to heaven. But um, but the whole area of international education probably wasn't working for me. I don't know if it was working for them. When you fail to get an in interview for a job in Mongolia, it made me think you're reflecting on your background and what you're doing. So I applied to be principal of Our Lady of the Sacred Heart School in Wadi in the Northern Territory. And believe me, there's not a lot of competition for that job. <laughs> and so in 2012, I ended up there. Now, Wadi has got a lot of issues. And all the issues that we associate with remote education. High levels of poverty. High overcrowding in houses, and which leads to sleep deprivation. And more and more the research about the influence of sleep on all aspects of life comes in. So some of our kids are only getting to sleep about 4 o'clock in the morning, and then at 8 o'clock we come around knocking on their doors or you know, saying, well, it's time to come to school. And, um, and you know, we're a large school. Um, we're about 700 of us on the roll. We don't see 700 ever. And we and our kids suffer from trauma, um, hearing, loss of hearing is about 100% issue for our school. Um, but there is periodically clan fighting, which will, you know, mean kids don't want to come to school. We are well versed in doing lockdowns. We do lockdowns better than we do fire drills. And recruitment is an issue. That 
each year you're recruiting about 25% of your staff and you have to induct them there. And for us, we've got to be very clear and explicit about what we want. Okay, you know, we use the expression that success in our community is fragile. And it's hard one. And it's been one for the years of a lot of teachers have tried. So these are the challenges. Okay. Now what I, and there's not a lot of for people I mean there's not a lot of entertainment here. So and uh, I'm not a fisherman, which is the main hobby there. So actually for me I, I got involved in Twitter and in an education perspective. And I, for me, and that's what got me here is Twitter's like a large gathering, a large social gathering, and after an hour or two you ended up in the corner of the room where people most agree with you. And around education, I I ended up in this corner which believes on one of a better word and I'll talk about it later, a more traditional approach to education. And then you see people attacking this view and say something called right wing. I've been called a lot of things in my life, but I have never been called right wing. And I had to go to my bank statement and I say, yes, I'm still paying a substantial amount of money each month to the New Zealand Labour Party. And in any forum, I'm always the one who takes the left wing issues. So, but I have this view because I believe the best education, when we look at the research for poor kids, is actually coming out of the domains we're talking about. And Look, I, I come, you know, all my education is, um, you know, largely my teaching has been in the Catholic system. And I said, it's explaining here that it's fundamentally a different equation between Australia and New Zealand about how Catholic education works. But, um, you know, I haven't got time to go into it. But I mean, it's like Godsby already exists for us. And we are funded completely the same as the school down the road. States now. I, I really believe that you know the foundation of a strong democracy is strong school, good public education system, and if you're running a separate system, which you know I'm part of, it should not be playing on the other system. But I, I haven't got time to go through because look, I, I do come from my think for from it's it's from a Christian social justice tradition. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that we believe that we have a mortgage on social justice or things like that, but it's what fires me. And there's a term in, uh, in Catholicism which came out of South America in the 70s called a preferential option for a kid. And when we judge what's happening in education in our system, we need, and when I say system, why they in our schools and systems, we need to say, ask the question, what is operating for the kids who have the least amount of cultural capital, the kids from poverty, the kids from cold homes, kids coming to school hungry. What's happening for them? And that should be our judge. And uh, I'll uh, go to my next slide here. And look, this is, this is probably the only formal research I'm going to quote. And it's by Laura Galley who was a lecturer of mine in my master's. And he did a summary of New Zealand education in terms of international comparisons, terms of studies and things. From the first one in 1970 through to things in 2006. And he looked at how New Zealand had done in comparison in literacy and maths. And he said, look, the results were largely consistent that we've been in the middle of the road as far as maths, and but at literacy we were always one of the highest scoring nations. We went from 1970 to be the highest, but as far as English language learners, we were always up there, okay? And, and this was largely on a whole language approach. And whole language, I think, was more at home in Australia than New Zealand than it was in other parts of the world. So that, this was using a whole language approach. And, you know, I think it was common to both countries, but it's probably a bit like the America's Cup. We did something there, they still got to work for 30 years more sustained than you fellows do. Um, and the All Blacks. Yeah, and the All Blacks. But the America's Cup is what we're excited about at the moment. Yes. Um, but what 
this is what it found, and, and this is to where it's coming. It said, look, the best readers in New Zealand were the best readers in the world. And that was listing our average up. But we had this really long tail of underachievement. And underachievement in New Zealand plays out ethnically. That means that it played out in gender terms. So it was a real struggle for Maori kids, for Pacifica kids, and especially Maori and Pacifica boys. And so, you know, when we talk about research, we hear you know, a lot of whole language. Now, so we're by actual fact, it's not that it doesn't work. It just works for the wrong people. The kids we most want to have the opportunity of good education, the kids who most need it, it wasn't there. Okay? And uh, so that, that influences my, my approach and uh, where I'm going. And you know, this is a bit of a personal story about reading and engagement with research and reading in schools. And in 1993, I took up my first principal's position. And I came from what in Australian terms would be a middle school in a rural environment um, to a central city school in Wellington, a place called St. Anne's. And it was always the school, the Catholic school, it was the school of the immigrants. Okay? In the 90s, we used to say we were the most monocultural school in Wellington because our role was 90 to 95 percent Samoan, not Tongan or Maori or anything, just Samoan. And these, you know, and that was a pretty tough time economically for New Zealand in the 90s, early 90s. And these kids, a lot of their parents were unemployed or very uh, on very menial jobs. And times were hard financially. The kids were sort of subtracted by language. They spoke English, some English and some Samoan, but they weren't strong in both languages. And I arrived up there and, you know, we had some very dedicated teachers. But what was happening in classrooms and the approach reflected what, you know, there was the overwhelming discourse of education in New Zealand at the stage. It was whole language, it was children centred. A lot of student choice, a lot of project learning, a lot of the stuff we're getting that from. At the same time, one of the staff who worked with me in the rural middle school ended up moving also to another school in Wellington that was well exposed. Uh, Mainly European kids, affluent, well, lots of social cultural capital. Now, what was happening in this place was Scots College, and, and actually, there are only about four or five days apart. But what was happening there kids was a quite a traditional approach to education. Very structured, uh, very formal. And and I, I was thinking, look, I, I think we've got this around the wrong way. What we're offering our kids, our kids would be more a, a more structured approach to education would be a, a great advantage for our kids. And for kids who have all that cultural capital. You know, you can have a more progressive education. So, look, things that came out of me is that schools are largely about people in the classroom. And also, we, as a profession, there's a lot of autonomy in teaching. The beginning teacher closes the door. They may be observed and enjoyed from people from time to time, but largely, what happens in there from very early is, you know, the choices they make, okay? So trying to persuade people to approach education is difficult because sometimes when you see education change, the teachers will give you the rhetoric of the change, but not the practice. You get the sizzle without getting the sausage. So, so that's the same. The other thing is, if you want to make change, you can't enforce it. You've got to persuade people. And you've got to take where they come. Because if you are, I mean, teachers are naturally, I think, by default, attracted to a sort of warm, compassionate, open, caring, 
humanist and children and sneakers. They're, they're based on some of the people that come into education. And we think, well, you, you wouldn't want it any other way. I mean, if they're on the odds at the end of the spectrum, you'd like to think they're in the military forces or some places like that. But that's who comes into education. So you've got to deal with people where they are. This is something like a say, but it's not always there. And you can't expect you to throw out this great bit of research you've read and send it out there in the institution. And if there's one thing I think we've learned in education uh, in, in the last 10 years is the importance of coaching psychologists. That if you want to bring change in, you've got to be working beside people. You've got to be observing their practice, involved in guidance. The idea that we might go for a three-day course at the beginning of the year and say, you know, here's the books and go and do it. You know, I saw once where it was recorded as train and hope. So anything successful has got to be nursed in. You've got to be very explicit about what you want. And, you know, a coaching model, I think, is, is showing us a way to go. You've got to be, and you do have to be explicit about what you want. Let's check how we're going for time here. Eight, five minutes to go, did you say? <laughs> okay. Um, so look, and if you were if you were trying to influence practice, you're gonna think about what we what are you talking about using evidence-based or research-based practice. You know, as I said, you can ask the major researchers, who is it working for? And you know, a lot of studies, and uh, I suppose an area of research I've been into a fair bit is the study of Islamic India. And, you know, and it's not high quality research in that field, but they don't really ask what sort of leaders it's working or not really working for. So, as I say, when we look at research, we've got to be asking, this is the effect, but was it the effect on which group of learners? You've, I think, you know, John Henry is greatly up to the on what we do, but you've got to be looking at it qualitatively as well as quantitatively research. And one of the most fascinating bits of research on Come across and actually I studied on the evidence was the late Graham Knuckle and Adrian Alton Lee, who what they did was they mic'd up kids in classrooms and they listened and as they mic the teacher and saw the interaction between the kids and listened to the discussions of self talk the kids were having to talk to their neighbours. And it was a fascinating understanding of what really happens deep down in classrooms. So, I mean, I think you've got to approach research from both angles. And I I do try and read the Hidden Lives of Learners, you know, every year to 12, uh, 18 months, just to you know, reconnect myself with what's happening. And I mean, one of the things is, as a principal, you're always reading, you know, things about social skills and cooperation, how they get on with other kids. And what Graham's really to say, as the teacher, you have got no idea in the world what's happening. It's like a prison community, it's a subterranean thing below the surface of what's happening. And one of the most interesting bits of research they did was just these were done across classrooms in the 80s. How racist the comments of kids were with each other. And one of the research article it was titled Get Your Brown Hand Off My Book. You know, and it was fascinating. So I think we've got to take the research from the types of which John Hattie does, but this really in depth uh, work we can look at. You've got, if you believe that your research informs your practice, you really have got to be open to changing your views. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be using education research to support you in your next argument with somebody who might have a different view on that. You, you, if you make a stance that and I use research informed practice in the schools I leave, you've got to say to yourself, okay, when did I last change my view? Now, working in a remote indigenous community, 
the community is struggling with the faith. And as John Hatton says that most interventions work. And if you read research in the religion and stuff, you say, well, actually, a lot of the interventions don't work. And, and that's because usually the research has been on long enough. It also means that quite often they didn't ask the fundamental question for who. Because unless you take account of who's attending, uh, you know, you, you learn nothing. And, um, you know, so, you know, you need to know what is the impact of high attending kids. And in our community, a high attending kid is somebody that attends 80% or more, four out of five days a week. You know, your woman was back home, but the child was attending 90% of the time. And that means by the time they're 14, they've lost the whole year's education. Why well, didn't intervene. In the school of work, and if you attend 80% of the time, we'll give you a prize. You know, we'll give you a big prize at the end of the term. So you've got to ask, if you're not interested in the remote indigenous education, what was the effect on the kids that attended the most? Uh, the other thing is context is so crucial in this field of remote indigenous education because we've got three broad bands of indigenous school students. We've got the um, what's happening in urban communities, you know, the likes of Redfern and things like that. And there is evidence that you know things are getting better there. We've got to ask, okay, and then the other Broad group as to more what you find in rural Queensland, South Australia, and uh, Western New South Wales. What's happening in Burkitt and Canyon? And that's it's a different group. And then what's happening in a place like ours, remote, is an entirely different topic, right? In terms of English, uh, we start off with a uh, first three years as totally bilingual, uh, totally in the first language. Then, then the progress is a bit of step modeling. But our kids are only speaking English largely when they talk to the teacher. The rest of the time they're speaking their own language. And this is great because our little part, the, our, the language in our community, they believe is the strongest indigenous language in Australia. It's got a thousand speakers, a thousand speakers under the age of 10. So that, that, that is a, a language that's not about to die. But you've got to take account of this context, and also there are only three schools that have a three remote schools with a indigenous schools that are enrolled five hundred plus. And what's happening in a big community like ours is a lot different than, uh, say, a smaller community with a bigger school of all sixty. So that, these are some of the things you have to be asking at the research if you are working in your area. So as I go back into sort of getting into Twitter debates, I've sort of lined it up as a continuum of over this side you, you have what we might term a progressive approach to education and what's been called, you know, a traditional model, well, I, uh, or a conservative model. Now I don't like the terms and I think we're stuck with them, but I, I'd like to that a more structured approach to education. So, um, you know, on this side is this emphasis on higher order thinking skills, which I'm very questioned about in any context. Um, uh, I, I remember having a uh, debate in a hotel 10 years ago about the New Zealand curriculum, and people saying, you know, teach them higher order thinking skills. And my, my thing is, if you teach them to read very well, they do lots of reading. They think very well, those kids. But the importance of, um, I don't know anybody know the word, the Persian states, who really believes that you've got to teach kids lots of knowledge. And the kids from poor backgrounds, the ones who most need that cultural language, uh, and uh, Rob Mazzano does the same thing about vocabulary. And uh, it was, you know, a lot of 
about what you were talking about earlier this morning when you were saying about you know, the academic vocabulary. So you've got to have, if you're teaching kids like ours, or you're teaching in a poor background, you've got to be working on teaching a lot of knowledge and a lot of vocabulary. A lot of whole class teaching. I, I can live a bit with more uh, smaller group teaching and literacy, but in mathematics, and this is my experience from when I was back in the primary class, I really believe that you know, you've know got to be teaching a lot of explicit whole class practice. And I used to say, you know, I probably said that some of you in my class, one group of 30 or 30 groups of one. Okay, and that's how we need to be approaching it. We've got to, um, you know, what has been shown on research time and time again is a model of explicit teaching. Has the biggest effect for kids who come in to education with some serious issues. Okay, and the research of those people who were in Greg's um, presentation earlier today, I think he defined and explained very much what is meant by explicit teaching. Um, yeah. One thing that I, I do particularly challenge with is this idea of lifelong learning. And you know, I think well, we're all about formation and educating good men and good women. But in the last school community I led in New Zealand, you know, I, I made this very explicit. Our jobs was to put those kids in high school so that they could access the field. They had the knowledge and the skills, the fluency that they can make sense of it. And where the term of millennium was uh, the idea of current and quality management in education kind of people in the leagues that seem to pay more. But I thought it had a lot to say to us. There's more dialogues between school systems at the transition from primary to secondary, from secondary back to primary, early child. I, I think it's a lot more. One of the things that I have trouble in the debate is the view from people who are espousing this form of view that this approach is a conservative form of thing. Look, there's no language on that. That you can be approaching that sort of education based on very good student relationships between teachers, which are crucial and more crucial to poorer kids than anybody else. Absolutely crucial. So you can be approaching the curriculum and your pedagogy from that angle, but you can have warmth, compassion, good relationships at the same time with teachers highly trained in the skills of classroom management, uh, explicit rules and consequences, and a whole school approach. But um, yeah, to say, look, you know, all my reading and all my say, if, if we want best deal for the kids who need it most, we've got to be approaching education from this and that perspective. Okay. Um, How are we doing for time now, people? Yep. Well, I've got uh, two academics beside me, and I, I guess they, they, they identify as indigenous, but I think they come from mixed families, one of the Dutch father and something else. Both went to a local indigenous school, uh, and it, the charter of the school was to maintain the indigenous culture. But most of it never sent their kids there because there's, there seems to be in them some sort of a tension between what part of the culture do they maintain and what part do they give up? Because if they don't give up enough, then it's not consistent with academia and Western academia for success. And for their kids, eliminates their opportunities to make sort of high, you know, the, the better jobs and the stronger knowledge forms and stuff like that. How do you balance this tension uh, from your experience? Well, I, I don't know the answer to that. And, and it's somewhere, it's something I, I, you know, live with and think with daily. Um, and some of it, you know, so I, I call some of my role as tutor and business and more like that. Okay? And where I went to 2012 for what year, I thought that, that we would run such a fantastic school that there would be no need for kids to move and go 
like the schools in Queensland or uh, Melbourne or things like that. Now, now I'm of the belief that your best kids, kids you hope to empower, who can be the community leaders yeah, for the next generation, they do have to lead. But look, there are some, some pretty poor schools in that, this game at the moment as well. Some that are only clear about the rep study and getting mums on seats. Really interesting one to follow, and I was talking to him there yesterday. Uh, Melbourne Indigenous Transition Schools, which has just started a couple of years ago, have some really good models and approaches. But yeah, no, that's a hard question. And I, I, I mean, in our community, what largely they want the language maintained, they want the approach maintained, but they want excellent, they want excellent teaching and. In a bilingual school, there's a, there's a lot of argument that we should get away with that. But in part of the program, we should teach English art. My view is we've got to have excellent pedagogy in both languages. And I think that was what was lacking when I went there. And you know, now you know, I'm a lot more comfortable with it. The pedagogy that we're using in Moon Park is uh, not strong. Yet. So the schools become literate in their first language. Literacy, that's their first literacy. Um, yes, literacy. yeah, and that's our goal. And if they if they turn up, they do. Yeah. But if they don't, they you know not. I mean, it, look, it, it's such that it, it, it's a funny system in that we get huge numbers of kids turn up the first ten weeks. We get very high numbers, and uh, and then throughout week eight, week nine, a number of them say, "Well, I'm quite strong in English, but still boring, and I'm not going." And, and you'll see them very little for the rest of the year. And you might be teaching a class and you will have 25 kids in front of you on Monday and 20 away uh, uh, in front of you on Tuesday. But only 10 kids on Monday and Tuesday. You know, it's, it's there for those as well. Okay, look, with five minutes to go. Um, what is research based? Okay. Classroom management. Every day. Every day, uh, you've got to make this a focus. Every week, you've got to make this a focus, and we do a lot of training. We use a, a model from Queensland called the Essential Skills of Classroom Management and Classroom Profile. It's a coaching model. Um, it's not rocket science. It's the best of research that uh, the person who put it together as perhaps you know, might have been very well. And a huge amount on classroom relationships. And if you want to read about classroom relationships, Russell Bishop, who writes about cultural responsive pedagogy here in New Zealand, he is, you know, and, and that is what he's got to say applies to any kids from, you know, from difficult backgrounds. We talk a lot about the teaching of oral language, and it is so important, and it's very hard to find decent research on it. So right, I think this is really important. I want to go and pick up a master's paper on that. Here we are. So I, I think there's you know huge emphasis on that, but I'd like to see more research. The written and explicit instruction I talked about teaching and knowledge and vocabulary and really using you know fast, quick, uh, sustained data. And the thing and the thing we've got the most work on. You know, after reflecting on where we've gone and you know it's been such a journey for me because that's probably the one that I have should have put more attention to. Um, well, just finishing up. Look, these are the people that helped me sort of make sense about it. I, I talked about Graham's work on the hidden curriculum. I, I and his point does a lot of um, a lot of what we teach kids they already know. And you know that, that's something I'd really recommend. I, I, I think John Hacking, you've got to. I read where the stuff in the reference. You've got to take his evidence as a fuzzy picture. Important there, but it's not concrete. You know, it's a bit fuzzy. I really like anything that Dylan Williams has got to say. Um, and he writes like somebody's actually been in the classroom. And I, I think he's a very clear writer and a very good speaker. And I, 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 I get a lot of what he's 
if you want to have the debate about a more structured approach, you know, this is, this is the one I recommend for all my liberal progressive friends. You want to have a good read of it. You know, you know, it's not a great depth, but she certainly puts the arguments well with passion and pretty directness. Um, and, uh, you know, corresponding to this really, you know, the, the people who argue you know, about, the people who put the case for teaching knowledge and, and how important that is. Um, I'll talk about Russell Bishop. You know, and uh, cultural responsible pedagogy, which is basically says, and it's come out of my education in New Zealand, and saying, look, this thing of relationships and uh, very early research based in Alaska called warm demand, the warm demand of pedagogy. I think there's, you know, it's got a lot to say if we're working in. Uh, in cross-cultural ways, we're working with kids who haven't got the background that makes it easy to get education. So that's basically it. Um, I, I think you're important. Look, for our visitors from Saudi Arabia, the one I think would be, if I recommended a book for you to read, it would be The Hidden Lives of Learners. Okay? And I, I think it really is an in-depth understanding of what really happens to kids in their learning, what they need to do to actually improve their learning. Um, you know, that's the one I would recommend much. Thanks very much. Thank you, mate. Now, you're all going to, all going to room floor 17, okay? I was told to tell that.